Lord, may you have your way in this place. Lord, I pray that, Lord, as we walk away from here, that we would have been through that spiritual boot camp where we're prepared and ready for the battle. Lord, we pray that, God, you would make us the men of God you desire us to be. That you would forge us. You would temper us. And that, God, we would make a difference in this generation, in our community, God. But I pray you would start a fire in our nation, in our world. Lord, we ask that you bless now. Once again, as we open your word, God, you would apply these truths to us, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Why don't you have a seat, guys? As we wrap up our time together, what a wonderful conference. Encouraging. I believe God has spoken to our hearts. I I believe we can walk away right now and just say, all right, I got my job cut out for me. We have one more verse to cover. We're looking at this war that every man, every man of God is engaged in. And these last two pieces of armor would be the last two you would secure upon your body before you went into war. I, I kind of get the picture of uh, the football player going into the, fo- you know, into the field, and, and the last thing he does is he slaps on his helmet before he enters that field because he knows that he's about to engage, he's about to have the force of some 250 pounders smashing against them. And I think it's that same picture that Paul is giving and he's, is he's giving these last two pieces of armor. Verse 17, he says, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Two pieces of armor and this helmet of salvation was to protect against the crushing blows of the enemy's offenses. You see, it wouldn't take much to wound, to to take out a soldier if you were to even just gaze him with that double-edged sword. He would bleed to death in a matter of minutes, a matter of moments. And so he's encouraging the the Christian, to make sure that his sword, his his helmet is, is securely placed upon his head so that he's not taken out from the battle. And so what is this hope of salvation or this this helmet of salvation? It's it, it's First Thessalonians chapter five. It's the eighth verse and the ninth verse. Or I think we get a little more insight into what Paul is talking about when he says, Take on, put on the helmet of salvation. He says, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I, I thought, man, what, what, what a picture here. He's saying, hey, you need this, this hope of salvation because it's what's going to protect your mind from the crushing blows of the evil one, the enemy, Satan. He's telling us that you have a hope, that there's a finish line, and that finish line is heaven. Guys, I, I, you know, I... I think that there's often, in my own heart, there's times when I just get so overwhelmed with the spiritual battle that I face, that, that I, I, I've literally, when we first moved to Blend, I had told my wife, I, I would say on at least three occasions, you know what, let's get out of here, because the attacks were so heavy spiritually. 
And he said, you know what, you need that hope of salvation because it's in the hope of salvation that, that, that you, you can endure this battle that you're in. If you know that, you know what, there's a finish line. Can you imagine if you were, you were, you're, you're going to join a race and, you know, you line up for the race and they go, you know, okay, well, what is it, 21K? 7K? For me, it'd probably be a 1K. That'd be good. You know, when my boys want to race me all the time, I say, okay, right there. You know, I'll race you to there. <laughs> but, but to imagine if you entered a race and they said, okay, uh, there's no finish line. I forgot to tell you. You just keep running and running and running and, you know, well, you'll, you'll just never stop. And you're like, wait a second, I'm not going to join that race. It's a race that I can't win. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to run out of breath. And, and I think it's Paul simply encouraging the believer saying, you know what? That's the hope of salvation. That one day this race is going to be done. It's all going to be over. And then we're going to stand in the presence of Almighty God. And you're going to hear the words, if you've been a faithful servant, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. And it's that hope of salvation that, that you know, be, be because without it, it just takes that one gaze from the enemy's sword to, for us to just go, all right, I, I, I'm done. Saying, you need, you need to remember, man, that there's a hope that one day this battle will be finished and that the king of kings and the, and the prince of peace is going to come in. He's going he's to wipe out all of the dissension and all the lies and all of the attacks of the evil one. He's going to cast them into the lake of fire. And there's going to finally be peace. No more battle. No more war. I like how Paul says it in Romans 8, 18. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not to be worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He says, you know, you know, you know when, when it comes down to it, the sufferings you're enduring now aren't even comparable to what the joy you're going to receive when you stand before the presence of God. And I think it's the enemy's goal to discourage us. It's the enemy's tactic to overwhelm us so that we forget that one day, man, this battle will be over. And it works, like, it works something like this. Because you see, Satan is up there looking, you know, he just, he, he's looking to, to accuse you. We've seen that verse on several occasions in Revelation 12, 10, where it says, when Satan is finally kicked out of heaven, the, the, there's, there's a voice that goes forth, and the voice says this. He says, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren who accused them day and night before God has been cast down. And this accuser of the brethren who to this very day is bringing accusations against you and I before the throne of God. And, you know, there's those times when you just feel so overwhelmed and so condemned and maybe you've blown it in some area and you're just saying, you know what, why even continue in the battle? It's useless. It's hopeless. I, I, I keep falling. I keep failing. And why even, you know, get, get to the place? Or, or you even get to that place where, as Pastor Sean was sharing earlier, you know, it, you know I've, been, I've been a good guy. And, Lord, why are you allowing this to happen to me? I've been working hard. I've been reading my Bible. I go to church every week, and I, I mean, you let me go through this. And we forget there's a finish line. There's a finish line. And that finish line is coming. And, I, and in the meantime, we need to, we need to keep in, in the forefront, in our, in our thought, in our mind, in our heart, that, that one day, man, we're going to stand before God. Man, you will stand before God. That's the finish line. And it's that helmet of salvation. You're remembering, I, I'm saved. I, I know where I was delivered from. I know where I was heading. But God intervened, and he rescued me, and he saved me, and I got the promise of heaven to look forward to. You see, that, that's just that, that one little blow the enemy takes and just gazes off that helmet so you can continue in the fight. I, I, I didn't know my grandfather very well. Grandpa... Jaramillo was World War II veteran. And 
I heard stories. I, 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 I was pretty young when he passed. He was, he was a heavy drinker, and his liver gave out on him finally. But I, I, I remember talking to Grandpa a couple times when he pulled out a piece of a coin that he had in his pocket when he was in a firefight during World War II. And that coin, he says, I got hit, and I didn't know why I didn't go down. And he says it was not until he got back to camp that he pulled out a coin and he saw the bullet had indented that coin that probably saved his life. Guys, we have a helmet of salvation that as the enemy's throwing that sword to try to take us out, man, it just deflects off of it because you have the hope of salvation. We have the hope of eternity. It's to protect the mind from the arsenal of the enemy. He tells us in 1 John 5, 13, John says this. He says, I have written these things that you may believe in the name of the Son of God and that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Because I've given you this so that you would know that you have the promise of eternal life, the hope of heaven. And when we lose sight of that, man, it's easy to be disoriented. It's easy to be taken out. It's easy for us to to kind of throw in the towel and and become wounded soldiers rather than valiant soldiers. God loves you. God loves you more than you ever know. And his plan is for eternity with you. And the enemy wants to attack that. And he tells us in the next piece of the armor, and as we just, we just kind of skim through here, watch, watch what happens next. And he, he tells us, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, protecting the mind, and the sword is the only tool in your arsenal, the only, the only thing that you have that is a defensive tool as well as an offensive tool. It's to block as well as to slice. And he's talking about this particular sword. It wasn't the long sword. It would be the short sword. It was the one for for face-to-face battle. The one that you were in close in. And uh, Christian, understand something, man. Your Bible is your weapon against the wiles of the enemy. This is the only thing you have to offensively go against the wiles of the enemy, man. None of the other pieces of armor can accomplish offensive tactics. It's only the Word of God that can accomplish that. When Paul had went to Ephesus... In the book of Acts, chapter 20, I I love what he tells the leadership of that church as he's saying his farewells to them. If he's about to tell them, guys, I, I, I'm, I'm heading to Jerusalem and I don't think I'm coming back. And he's, he's giving his last words of encouragement to them. He tells them in the book of Acts, chapter 20, if you would turn there real quick, look at verse 28. Acts chapter 20. 28th verse. Actually, moving up a little bit, go, 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 go to verse 26. He says, Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourself and to the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to be shepherds of the church of God, which is purchased by his own blood. And when Paul's done, he says, you know what? I'm clean now. Why? 
because I haven't shunned to give you the whole counsel of God. He said, you know what? I gave you the weapon to fight off the attacks of the enemy and you can protect the sheep that God's entrusted to you because you have now the sword of the Spirit to defend and to offense the enemy's attack. But guys, let me tell you something, man. A sword is only as good as the one that's using it. You see, if you were to put a, a sword in my hand and, and someone who's been trained in, in, in that kind of warfare, he would take me out in a, in a moment's time. You see, it takes, it takes you becoming familiar with your sword. It takes you spending time in the Word of God so that you know, man, this is how I defend against the enemy's attacks and this is how I give my blow back and this is how it's done. And if it's a good swordsman, man, he, he, can, he can wipe out any attack coming against him because he has become proficient in his arsenal. And how much more, man, do we need to be men of the Word? You see, you need to know your Bible. And I, I love what, what Pastor Joseph says. You know what? Don't depend on your pastor to be the only place you get fed. And I, going to church is great and Sunday and Wednesday and Sunday night and any other opportunity you can to be with brothers and, and, and being taught the Word of God. Man, I encourage you to do so. But, man, that cannot be your only time that you spend time in the Word. You need to be proficient in the Word of God. If you're going to, to, to any kind of class to become proficient in something, you have to do your homework too. Right? You just don't show up to class and go, okay, teach me everything I go. I'm not just going to, you know, not practice. Like I, my, my son's practicing guitar. He wants to be a musician. He's, you know, been playing the guitar. And, and the first couple months, he, he, would, he would come to class and he would just, you know, whatever they taught him, and he would put his guitar away. And he never picked it up, you know, on his own time. They're supposed to teach me that there. And I go to, and it wasn't until a couple months ago that, that he started, I'd see him in his room, and he'd just start playing his guitar when, when you know, no one was around. And, and, and the other day, man, I was blown away because you, you don't understand, there, there is not a musical bone in the Jaramillo family. <laughs> to, to clap, I have difficulty on beat. If I'm sitting in the sanctuary, I usually sit at the back of the church because I, I offend everyone around me. Because I don't care, you know, I just, I'm just worshiping the Lord, man. You don't like it, I'm sorry, but everyone else is out of tune because they're listening to me. <laughs> and then I, 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 the other day, my, 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 my boy pulls me in and he says, Dad, check this out. And he starts playing a song and he's, you know, just singing and worshiping. And I'm just going, whoa. But it took the time to become proficient in it. You see, guys, we, we, guys we're in a war, man. And if you don't know how to use your sword, you're going to... You're going to be a wounded soldier. I think one of, the, one of the most powerful examples of that is, is, is watching the, the master soldier fight off the wiles of the devil. I read one commentary, the pulpit commentary, and, and, and it read this. It says, God's word is the truth that slays error, the love that, saves, that slays selfishness, the right that slays the wrong, and the happiness that slays the misery of the world. You see, it's God's word, the truth that slays the errors. It's God's word that, that slays the selfishness with love. It slays the wrong with right. You, know, you and I need to be proficient in it. It tells us in 1 Peter 1.23, it says, having been born again, not of the corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. You see, everything else is going to pass away. All the toys... All the things we've accumulated, all, the, all the, our, our titles and successes and everything we've accomplished in this world, it's all going to pass. But this is going to abide forever. It's truth. And we need to be proficient in that truth. In Matthew chapter 4, and I, I think here just an object lesson is, is we watch the master 
give us some lessons on how to fight that spiritual battle. Watch, watch what happens in Matthew chapter 4, beginning there in the third verse. It says, now when the tempter came to Jesus, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. It's interesting to me that Satan comes to Jesus and he's, he's attempting to, to, to ignite his fleshly desire. And in, 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 a, in a one, one that every one of us would say, you know what, there's nothing wrong with feeding the physical man. And all that Satan was doing to go, hey, since you're the son of God, why don't you just take that stone right there and turn it into bread? We know from that text that Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days and for 40 nights. He was at the literal place of starvation. And yet Satan was coming to tempt him with this fleshly need for food. And Jesus turned to him in verse 4 and he said, it is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And he's quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. It is written. You see, as the lies of the enemy come and, and try to deceive us and get us, a, you know, even something that you, might, you and I might think, hey, there's nothing wrong with making, you know, a stone into bread if you're that hungry. But Jesus was able to stand back and he says, you know what, man, man doesn't live by bread. It lives by the word of God. That's what supplies the, 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 the nutrition for his soul. That's, that's what sustains him. I, I, a few years back, I was just, man, I, you know, I, I was in that place where I was just struggling to get in my Bible. Honestly, just, I, I believe it was spiritual. And, and, and I, 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 was, I was struggling to sit down and, and just op, crack my Bible open and spend time alone with God. I, I, it was just a battle. And I came up with this great idea. I said, you know what? I, I, unless I read my Bible, I'm not going to eat. You guys want to conquer that battle, guys? Here's a good way to do it. You just go, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to eat a meal all day and, and, until I've sat down and, and spent some time alone with God and, and fed my spiritual man before I fed my physical man. Let me tell you, brother, I was reading my Bible three times a day <laughs> real fast. Because our physical desires have this, this power <laughs> to get us to do some, some pretty radical things, right? And, 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 and it's amazing because... You know, there, there's this, this whole idea where Jesus just comes back and, and he says, you know what, man? It's not about the physical. It's about the spiritual. And the spiritual supersedes the, 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 the physical every time. And we, we, need, we need to learn from that, man, that you know what? Our spiritual man is more important than our physical needs. And we, we, that needs to take precedence and priority. Notice what happens next in verse 5. It says, And the devil took him up into a holy city, into the holy city, and he set him up on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, You shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Again, you, you, you read that verse and you go, wait a second, man. G Satan is, uh, is up to his old tricks again. You see, the temple is where everyone met. And he's telling Jesus, if you just jump down, you just float down, and you know, you're just going to kind of descend upon the, the crowds that are gathered at the temple, and the, you know, the, the, the temptation for, for everyone to look at you and see you. And, and didn't God promise that you wouldn't hurt yourself anyway? Pride. Satan wants to work on your pride. Not only your flesh, but your pride. And, and, and what, what amazes me is that, is that Satan takes the word of God and he twists it just enough to make it sound like it was truth. He's quoting scripture. You, you guys ever know Satan quotes scripture? But he never quotes it properly. Remember back in Genesis chapter 3, Pastor Raul was was sharing, you know, just the woman changed the scripture just a little bit, and Satan plays on that. And here, once again, he, he's, he's, you know, twisting the scripture just enough. 
And Jesus turns to him and he says, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. It goes back to Deuteronomy 6.16. Guys, I think there's something that, that, that you and I need, need to understand as we're in this spiritual battle, man, is that me and you, you and I need to become proficient in this. You need to know your Bible, guys. You can't take my word for it. You can't take Pastor Joe's word for it or Pastor Rawls' word for it. You know what? You need to know your Bibles, man, because this is your sword. And, in, and we're living in a nation where there's a lot of deception. The deception is rampant, and, 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 and it's everywhere. On the television set, on the radio, it's in our churches. That means you need to be prepared because the enemy knows how to, how, how to twist that word just enough. It, it blows my mind that we're, we're, we're living in a time when, when you, can, you can attend a church and, and, and you don't even get this. <laughs> but I, I thank God for Calvary Chapel and Pastor Chuck and just his heart to say, you know what, we're going to teach systematically through the Bible because men need the whole counsel of God. It's interesting that in that uh, next attack of Satan, watch what happens, verse 8 there in Matthew chapter 4. He said, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I give to you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him alone shall you serve. In every attempt of Satan Jesus quotes the scripture. It is written, it is written, it is written. Guys, you want to have victory in the spiritual battle that you're fighting, man. Let me tell you, man, you need to go and understand what is written. Know where to find it. That was Deuteronomy 6.13. And and, and, in, in the book of Deuteronomy, against all the attacks of Satan, Jesus was able to take one book out of the Bible and he was able to defend against every attack of the evil one. I like that. You see, it's the word of God that that is that what you and I need, need to take to memory. And if you're struggling, as Pastor Raul was sharing earlier, man, you're struggling with pornography. You know what? You need to go and talk some some scripture you need to memorize some scripture it's going to kind of talk about the purity of, of the of the heart and the purity of the mind if you're struggling with anger man you, you need to go and study some of those proverbs that talk about you know be angry and not sinning and and, and talking about you know being uh one who gives a soft answer to turn away wrath and you know you, you we, we need to take this stuff and when those things begin to rise up inside of us that we go back and go okay god help me and, you know, quote those scriptures that apply to our situation. And that's really becoming proficient in the, in the word of God. That God would use these things. It tells us in the book of 2 Peter, and I ask that you turn there, 2 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which we do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our heart. We have the prophetic word, which you would do well to heed. It's what illuminates for you, man, truth. It, will, it, it is the light into your path. It, it's, it's what will show you what's right and wrong. It will illuminate for you whatever situation and, and, and confrontation and, and attack that you may be under. That you, If you take the word of God, it will illuminate for you what you need to do and how you need to respond. And then he tells us there that it was by revelation that it was received. Look what he says in verse 20. Now, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, that it was given by revelation, and it's that revelation that God gives to you and I. He reveals to us His truth. He tells us in verse 21, therefore prophecy never came by the will of men, but by holy men of God as they spoke, as, as, as God spoke, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 
You see, guys, this is not the writing of men, even though God used men to pen it, and he used their personality and their character to do so. But let me tell you something, man. It was the Holy Spirit that wrote this. And we need to understand that it's in this, man, that there's power. Now, it's interesting that he calls it the sword of the Spirit. Because it's when the Spirit of God and the Word of God come together, man, you have the power of God to work in every situation. It's alive. It tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, 4, verse 12, and verse 13, it says, For the Word of God is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even the division of the soul and the spirit and the joint and the moral and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there's no creature hidden from its sight. For all things are naked and open to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. And that, that, that scripture right there is powerful because this is, this is what we know, man. That it's the Word of God that cuts us. It's the Word of God that convicts us. It's the Word of God that, you guys, the reason we're having an issue in our society with the Ten Commandments being posted in our classroom or in our courtroom is because when you read the Ten Commandments, man, you're busted. Right? You're busted. And so if we, if we can remove the Ten Commandments, then there's no more cutting. And we can continue in our sin that every man does what's right in his own eyes. Because when you read, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. That's, that, that's man's responsibility. That's God's commandment to us that, that you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. When all those things are thrown out there, it, it, it convicts us that we're sinners and we're guilty before God. And I don't know about you, man, but you know what? There's sometimes when I, I'm reading through the Word of God and I'm just going, busted. Busted. God help me. I messed up again. And I, I didn't even see it. I, you know, I was blindsided, man. But you know what? God's Word is always there to, to operate, to, to, to slice open. Those things in our, in our minds and in our hearts and our lives that, that we ourselves would never, ever deal with. It's sharper than his two-edged sword and it cuts between the bone and marrow and it even knows the intents and the thoughts of the heart. I remember the first time, man, when I, when I gave my life to Christ, I, I, I was convinced that my mom had talked to Pastor Raw because he knew everything that I was doing wrong. It was like details. And I was just going, dude, someone snitched me out. And let me tell you what I know now. It was the Holy Spirit that had cut through my heart. And he exposed, man, the ugliness that was in there. And he was trying to operate, man, not only a sword, but a scalpel to come in and remove the cancer that was in me. And it's the word of God, man, that you and I have in our hand not only to defend against the enemy man but let me tell you something this word of truth will bring men to salvation what did what did paul say in romans chapter 1 verse 16 he says he goes i am not ashamed of the gospel of jesus christ for it is the power of god to bring men to salvation and guys we need to be standing for that Sean talking about the shield of faith, but you know what? You got the shield of faith that'll get you to the gate, but you got to fight the battle with the word. And if you don't know it, man, if you don't know it, how do you use it? You need to be a student of it. You need to become proficient in it. You know how to f need to know how to fight this battle that you face. Second Timothy three sixteen it says all Scripture is given of God and it is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped in every good work. You see this Scripture God breathed. 
God breathed. And it tells us that it's where we're to discover truth, doctrine. You see, you don't come to the Bible and go, okay, I know what I believe. Now let me find out what, how, to, how to back up what I believe with a couple of verses from the Bible. And you see, there's a lot of cults out there that do that. I, on Friday, I had a, a young couple from the church that came, that, you know, just a couple years in the Lord, and they're going, man, these Jehovah Witnesses, man, they're just throwing all these verses. And I mean, what do I do with it? And, you know, you're just going, man, you know, the, these cults know how to take one verse, and, and, and they come with their doctrine, and they try to get the, the verse to, to line up with their doctrine. Twist it just enough. You see, you come to the Word of God saying, God, what you say is true. Now form my doctrine. I'm going to build my teaching, what I believe, upon what you've said. And he said, it's also not only for doctrine, but it's for reproof. And reproof means to be tested or convicted. It's, 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 where, it's where you get through the fire as the word of God is going forth. And then it says it's also for correction and the, just a simple and changing of character and, and giving us uh, in the right state. You, you see, man, when I, when I came to Christ, I had some messed up thoughts. What I thought God said. I, I, I thought cleanliness was next to godliness. I thought that was a Bible verse. And I tell you, I, Mary, I, I thought, man, God had to make pot because it's natural. I was convinced that there was a Bible verse that said, you know, you can smoke it if it's natural. You see, I had some warped thinking. But as you come to the Word of God, you see those things. I mean, I sex, I, I thought, man, it, you know, as long as you care. Love had nothing to do with it, just as long as you care. Right? And, and we come in with some messed up thoughts. And, and, and then you, all of a sudden you start coming to the Word of God and it starts to correct and, and reprove and, and, and instruct. And in what's right? Righteousness. And then your character now becomes formed because it's lining up with the Word of truth. You see, guys, we need to line our lives up with this. If it says it here, then it's true. And if it doesn't say it here, man, then it's a lie. And we're under attack by the enemy. And let me tell you something, man. Our nation is, is it, we, we are doomed if we don't change course. You see, we were founded on the principles of this book. Our forefathers died so that this book would be the governing factor of our nation. Some of the great men of our founding, I, I, I think of Abraham Lincoln, who said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has given to men. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicate, communicated to us through this book. Patrick Henry, the American patriot, he says, give me liberty or give me death. He said this, the Bible is worth more than all other books which have ever been printed. Charles Dickens, the great literary writer, he says, the New Testament is the very best book that ever was or ever will be known in the world. Ronald Reagan said, within the covers of this one single book, the Bible are all the answers to all the problems we face today. If only we would read it and believe it. Guys, this is the book. Henry Ward Beecher, famous 19th century preacher, son of Lyman Beecher and Harriet's brother, said this, sink the Bible to the bottom of the ocean and still man's obligation to God would not be unchanged. He would have the same path to tread, only his lamp and his guide would be gone and the same voyage to make, but his chart and his compass would be overboard. You see, guys, this is God's heart. You want to know God, you get to know this book. And it's what's going to fight off the attacks of the enemy. 
And I think we've become soft when it comes to spending time in this. We haven't become a, a proficient in the word of truth. And I pray, man, you know, all of these things we've talked about this evening, we, we've, you know, went through the whole armor, the shield, the helmet, the, 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 the breastplate, the, 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 the sandals. When, Greg, when Ray talked about girding up, I mean, I, I, I went water skiing with a guy, man, I, that was just a gross sight for me, just... Girding up the loins with your, you know, but did, you know, you, you, you just look at, guys, we, we, we've covered the, the, the armor, man. We've covered what, what needs to be covered for you and I to go out and back into our workplace and back into our wives and back into, in, into our homes and, 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 and just stand, you know what, man, I'm going to stand on the truth of God by faith, by righteousness, the gospel. God help us. God help us, guys. We, 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 we need to stand up and be men and fight this battle. We have everything we need, man. It's all given to us. What are you going to do with it? We're going to partake of communion right now. And I, I'm, I want to ask this. Before, before the team comes up and, and everyone comes out, man, I, I'm just going to ask that, that there would be just, I, I think for every one of us, just an examination of our own hearts after what God's spoken to us today. And that, man, if there needs to be some repentance, that, that, that this would be a time we do that, man. We're, gonna, we're about to partake of the, the, the bread, the cup, the body, the blood. You see, this isn't an issue of whether God will forgive you. It's an issue of us standing before God and saying, God, I need you. I need you. And what we're going to do, man, is we're, we're, I'm just going to I'm just going to close in a word of prayer. And if and if you're here today and you're saying, you know what, man, there, there's issues in my life, and I I I I need, I need God. Before we take a communion, I'm going to ask you to stand up, and we're going to pray for you guys, man, that that and understand whether it, it was that faith or whether it, it it was it was the righteousness or whether it's the helmet or the sword, whatever issue you're. Going, man, I, I, I realize, man, that I've been ripped off by the enemy, man, and I'm not going to do that anymore. I want to stand up and I want to be a man, a man of God. Father, we come to you. Lord, we know that, God, you've given us all that's necessary to be victorious, to be warriors, to be men who, who fight this battle that we find ourselves in. And Lord, I pray for these men this morning, this evening. Lord, as we've come, just to, to get away, to, to just, Lord, wash our minds and our hearts and, and our, our, just our thoughts and everything that, that we're battling with. God, I ask that, God, today, God, that it would be a turning point. It would be that crossroads in our life where, where we, we just, we just kind of set different courses Lord, if we're struggling with the pornography, that today would be the day where we said, God, I, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean my house. I'm going to throw my computer away if that's what's necessary. I'm going to set up accountability so that that ain't what's gripping me anymore. If it's some other issue, pride, lust, desire to be something in this world, God, I pray today you would just, Lord, break us. Maybe even today, God, there's some of us here that need to surrender because we haven't surrendered. And we need to join the army, the winning team. And just quickly, guys, when we partake of communion, I'm, I'm going to ask that today if God has spoken to your heart and you're saying, you know what, man, I need to make some changes. I'm going to ask you to stand up. I know some of you guys are already standing, but if, if you're here... You know what's you, you know what you know what's up already, man. God's been speaking to you. I want to pray for you before you partake of communion. Just by standing and saying, you know what, man, I, I, I need God. I need him. And it takes some humility to do that, I realize. And our nature's prideful.
But if God's dealing with you, man, you have to give. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? We're going to pray right now. Man, God's still speaking to you. You know who you are. You know what's going on. In the depths of your heart. Father, I come to you. We come to you. Fallen man. We don't have the power without you to fight this battle. So God, we cry out for you to cleanse us. forgive us. We thank you for your righteousness that's imputed to our account. We thank you, God, for the faith that you've given us victory over this, this enemy who's seeking to destroy us. God, may we put that armor on that helmet and may we take that sword God may we be victorious Lord I pray you bless these men I pray God that you would empower them with your Holy Spirit I pray that God you would Lord descend right now upon them fill them afresh Lord as they go back home and their wives their children would see that you've touched them. They go back to work to, on, on, on Monday, God, that they, they, they would, there would be a, a, a countenance that's different about them. That you give them, Lord, boldness. That you give them courage. That you would give them a hunger for your word. That, God, you would be glorified in their lives. We commit them to you right now. I thank you for them. And Lord, now as we partake of this communion, God, may we be reminded once again that you've done it all, that you gave your life, and you did it for us. Let's just worship the Lord. The communion team is going to come and distribute the elements. If you want to stand, you're welcome to stay standing. We're going to worship right now. We're going to be passing the cup, the bread. I'd ask you guys hold on to that. And together as a, as a group, man, as men, we're going to partake together. So as we, uh, as we just worship the Lord. Righteousness for me, he stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. Your blood, it speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon the earth. It speaks righteousness for me. It stands in my defense. When Jesus, it's your blood.
Testifies in grace and tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us. Now boldly we approach by earth of confidence. It's only by your blood, Lord. Yeah. wash. blood that was offered for your body that was lifted up. Lord, we hold in our hands a reminder of the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Lord, we didn't do anything to deserve it, and we haven't earned it in any way. But you've offered to us forgiveness. Lord, all we can say is thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the cross. Lord, we ask as we now partake of this together. We're reminded that this bread, one bread, we become one, one with another. Brothers in the Lord, standing in this battle side by side. Lord, we're one because we partake in that same offering. So Lord, we ask that you bless this bread now as we give thanks. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake of the bread, guys, together. Lord, we think of the precious blood of Jesus. The sinless blood. The perfect sacrifice. And to think that you would do it all for us. Amazing. We know without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And Lord, you came to to forgive and you shed it all. Lord, bless now this cup as we partake together in it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake of the cup together, guys. 